a story here. There are, uh, it, it, it's hard to, um, to have stories that go along with judgment, eternity, and understand this is just a joke. It's a story, so take it for that, okay? It's theologically not accurate, but okay. So there's this guy, he, he dies, and he goes to, to the pearly gates. And before he gets into heaven, someone meets him at the pearly gates and says, Say, um, we've ex- expected you. Uh, the problem, we have a problem. We, we've been checking out your life, and we're unable to really find anything significant, good or bad, that happened in your life. So we're really not sure what to do with you. So this guy says, oh, okay. And, and so the, this person at the gate said, uh, so I'll tell you what, um, can you tell us, is there anything in your life that was significant enough that might help us in making this decision? He thinks for a second or two, and he says, yeah, you know, I was driving down the road once, and I saw a lady being harassed by a bunch of bikers, motorcycle gang. These guys, just like Mike does, no, <laughs> these, these, guys, these guys were in leather vests, they had the colors, they were... They were nasty-looking guys. So I stopped the car. I went out in the trunk and got my tire iron from the trunk. I went up to the biggest, the strongest, the nastiest-looking guy. He had a nose ring. I went up, and I ripped that nose ring out of his nose, and I said, listen, let this lady alone, or else you're going to have to deal with me. And this person at the gate said, wow, that's amazing. When did this happen? He goes, yeah, about two minutes ago. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> let's get going. Um, we're, we're going on in our, in our journey, um, eternity-minded, being eternity-minded people. And there's a lot of truths that come with this series. And, and you know, it, it may well, things I say may, may make some people not want to come back, make some people not want to listen to me. But I'm telling you what, this is the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall Make you free. And if a man is free, he is free indeed. And so truth is very important to us. A truth is good. It's difficult. How many know that the truth is difficult, especially when you've been raised a certain way or been come to believe some things a certain way? But I'll tell you this. Um, no matter how many people choose to believe something, you could have a million people choosing to believe abortion is okay. And you could have a dozen people believing that abortion is an abomination to God, which is the truth. It doesn't change the truth. No matter how many people choose to believe abortion is okay, it doesn't change the truth that it is wrong in the sight of God. He looks down on that. And by the way, that's, just a, that's not a political stance. That's a spiritual stance that I take here. So I'm letting you know about that. So last Sunday, um, I mentioned that there would be several judgments and we're going to look at one of these right now. Um, and, I, and I'll say this. My title is The First Judgment. Now, maybe it's, a, it's a, probably a bad title. This is not meaning that there's judgments in successive order necessarily because something hap- some things hap- will happen simultaneously. But uh, there are a couple that happen in succession. One has to happen first. And we're going to get to that today. So I'm just telling you this so... Don't think that this is the very first judgment that there is going to be. Not necessarily so. So bear with me on this. I want to today kind of look at this a different way. Uh, maybe more of a story. We've got a lot of scripture, you see. So we're going to be, I, I really feel strong that this needs to be backed by the word of God. So um, let's just work with me on this. Let's say that you were summoned by the Lord, that you were called by the Lord to go home, which is just a nice way of saying you died. Okay, so the so Lord calls you home, and um, you find yourself immediately outside of heaven, up there outside of heaven. You find heaven, this place is more beautiful than you could ever have imagined. Um, it, you, could, you could never, never in your wildest dreams understand how beautiful this is, but you and all the others that died at the exact same moment are outside of the gates of heaven at this time. And as you're brought into this large hall, you, I'm just making you feel good on this one, you are brought into the the hall of eternal life. Okay? Now, understand that this is Tim's imagination working here. You're brought into the hall of eternal life, and the thing is, 
many, many, many more of the people that came and died at the same moment you did are taken into the hall of justice, of judgment. And so, what I'm saying is, there are more people going into the hall of judgment than to the hall of eternal life. And we'll get into that in the next few weeks about, about why I say that. So, as I mentioned um, about these judgments, this is the first one we're talking about. Since the what-ifs and the what-abouts are too many, let's just take a look. I'm going to take a look at two types of people that may be, no, that will be um, very, very disappointed when this judgment occurs, this just judgment comes their way. In this hall of justice, judgment is going to be given, and this is the judgment I'm talking about today is the judgment of unbelievers. We're going to talk about that here today. Um, keep in mind and keep this scripture in mind throughout this entire thing, probably throughout the entire series. Jesus said this. He said, he who rejects me does not receive my sayings, has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what judge, will judge him at the last day. Did you get that? The word I spoke, the word in the Bible, the word of God will judge that person in the last day. We, you and I are going to use the standard of the Bible. The word of God will be what judges us in that day. So we're going to look at this person, one person right now. This person is, a, is an independent person. He's got an independent spirit. And I'm going to, just for sake of a name, instead of calling it this person all the time, I'm going to call him Albert. I don't know why. I just kind of, thinking about this, need to put a name to this person. So I pull a, a name out of there. So if you have a relative named Albert, understand I'm not picking on your relative, okay? I don't think there's an Albert here. So we're good to go. So anyway, <clears throat> Albert is a, a very independent person. You know this type of person. This is a person who will not believe in Jesus Christ, let alone a Jehovah God, because why believe in something you can't see? Why believe in someone you can't touch or feel or talk to? Why believe in this person? You know, I'm, I am a God unto myself, basically, is what they're thinking. I can take care of myself. I don't need to have any of this wimpy Christian stuff going on. And this person will refuse to believe this, that this, this Bible, it's just a bunch of rules that you Christians need. You know what type of person I'm talking about? You ever seen this type of person, you know? Albert wants nothing to do with the church or even learning about what Jesus has to offer in sacrificing his life. Now, you could easily say that Albert is probably an atheist, and I would say this, that, yeah, he probably is an atheist, and, in fact, um, a lot of atheists really aren't atheists. They just don't know it. Um, but Albert is one because Albert's heart is seared. His heart is hard. Remember what I said a few weeks ago about once a person has hardened their heart toward Jesus Christ, there is no turning them back. It is hardened. It is seared. Paul talks about the heart being seared as with a hot iron in Corinthians and that there's no turning that person back. There's no chance for them because they have basically said, you know, that, that there is no way and they're, and they're just turned their heart, turned their face from God. And that. So Albert is now standing before, he's called to stand before Jesus at the judgment. And there is Albert's going into to the judgment hall. I just Picture it with me. I'm not saying that this is exactly how it's going to be in heaven. Don't walk away and say, this is what Tim said it's going to be like. But just my mind is working here, okay? So Albert's going into this judgment hall. This is an amazing place. It's grand. It is just beautiful. And there before him is a glorious throne. And sitting on the throne is the one. The one who is the source of all light in heaven. The Bible tells us that. The one who is radiant. The glorious, holy, holy, holy. He's majestic. Yet at the same time, he is resolute. He is solid. Isaiah gives us a picture of a vision that he has of heaven. He said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Imagine that. So he is elevated high. He is exalted above all. The appearance of Christ at that moment would be frightening for Albert at every step he took, bringing greater terror to his heart as he came before the throne. I will say this, Albert probably actually fell down before the Lord. Isaiah here, when he, in Isaiah 6, he says he, he fell before the Lord and he trembled at the foundations. And in John, as John comes, the revelator comes before the Jesus, um, glorified Jesus, 
He says he fell as if dead. In Revelation it tells us. So many people, I believe, when they come before the throne are going to fall not to their knees, they're to their face. Because you are in front of the Almighty, the Sovereign, the Great I Am. There is another, no one before him, no one after him. He is a great, he is a holy. At this point for Albert, though, all the confidence is gone. Any confidence he had is gone. Jesus says in Matthew 10, he says, Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, don't fear man. Don't fear somebody else. You can't do anything to your soul. Your soul is, is, is what we're talking about here. Fear the one who's able to destroy both. So this fear and trepidation comes into Albert. Revelation 2, 23 tells us this. Then all will know I am the one who searches hearts and minds and will repay each of you for what you have done. So Albert, at this point, I believe, is asked to give an account of his life, much like in the parable of the, of the uh, unrighteous steward that Jesus taught of in Luke 16. So he calls him, and he says, Give an account of your stewardship like the master. The master who's gone away, and this, he leaves everything to the steward, and the steward starts beating the other slaves and everything else. He's, he's wicked. He's wretched man. And the master comes home and says, give an account. And I believe that's what Jesus is talking about here. It's time for everybody who comes before him to give an account of the stewardship. But before Albert can say anything, his entire life is laid out for everyone to see. Everything is laid there for everyone to see. All the deeds, everybody in the great hall can see this. Every deed, every word, every selfish motive, every vile ambition, everything that is in his life, is laid bare, of course, that lines up with what Hebrews tells us. It says, not a creature exists that is concealed before his sight, but all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Think how you feel. Everything in your life being laid open before the judge, which really in some ways is useless because he already knows. But it's right because that is what you judged upon. So Albert, who few refused to believe in Jesus Christ, at this point all he can do, he believes now, but it's too late. And all he can do is fall back on the hope that just maybe the good things he did outweigh the bad. I had a man once, and I think I've told you this before, who who was, came to me, and, and he, he'd done some things for a church, helped the church and helped people. And um, we were talking. He said, yeah, my wife asked me why I do all these good things. I say, well, I hope it counts for something. I'm sorry. It's not a matter of how little or how much you break the law. James 2.10 tells us, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. Oops, I guess I don't have this one up here. James 2.10 says this. Um, for the person who keeps all the law except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. Let me just say that again. For the person who keeps all the law except one is just as guilty as a person who breaks all of the laws. And then Jesus at this moment tells Albert, your name is not written in the book of life. That is something we do not want to hear. We are looking to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, aren't we? We are not looking for it here. No, I can't find the name. And he's found guilty for not living for Christ while on earth. And there it comes. Therefore, I said to you that, un, that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You need to believe. And Acts 2, 4, 12 tells us there is salvation in and through no one else, for there is no under, other name under heaven given among men by and in which we must be saved. For Albert, who rejected the notion of Jesus Christ and all Jesus had to offer him, it was too late. He rejected the name of Jesus, rejecting the Son of God, who alone could save. 
Now, this type of person may well run through life believing that between their good deeds and the fact that they were heard from other Christians that if anyone can be saved, they should be good to go. Kind of like the man I spoke to some years ago who said to him, I'm not worried about getting right with God right now because I know what your, your Bible says, and it says that if I wait to the last minute, I'm good to go. And I said, you're right. It does say that, talking about the different workers that come and the, and the master pays them all the same. But I said, here's the problem. You don't know when your last minute is. And the other problem is, who wants to go in eternity knowing that I could have done this for Jesus? I could have done this for the sake of the cross. I could have. I think maybe there's going to be some disappointment and glory when we think about what we could have, but we didn't because of selfish motives and vain conceit. We have to understand that it's not about just doing good. Paul tells us this. He says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. And if we understand that, I think we understand the words of Solomon thousands of years earlier said, he who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. Thousands of years before Jesus, he who fears the commandment lives by what is told to him, lives by what he's supposed to do, will be rewarded. Now at this point for Albert, Jesus will live out his words of his parable in the marriage feast. The marriage feast is when, when um, he calls, calls people to come to the, invites people to the marriage feast and people say, I'm too busy, I can't come now, I can't do this. So he tells his servants, go out to the byways and the highways and invite people to come. And finally they get some people to the marriage feast, but it, as he sees, he sees one person who's not dressed appropriately for the marriage feast. He doesn't have wedding garments on, marriage, wedding clothes on. So Jesus sees that, the, 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 the person sees that, Jesus says, and he says to this, and I think he's going to say this to Albert, he says, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. That's why I said before, with Albert, there's not as many going with him, or, or, or no, with, with you, there's not as many going with you as with Albert. Most of the people are going to go with Albert. Many are called. Every one of you are called. But so few say yes. So here's where some speculation happens among theologians. For those who do not receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, death means eternal punishment. The unbeliever, as I read the Bible seems to be sent immediately to a temporary holding place to await the final resurrection, judgment, and eternal destiny. Now, hold on to that for just a second. We have to understand that. We're going to take you to the, the rich man and, and Lazarus. The story in Luke 16. If you want to turn there, you can. Now, in Luke 16, it tells us this. Now, a poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is a, is a Jewish term of endearment of being, um, going to heaven, of being in a good place, being with Abraham. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. Here, the rich man is tormented immediately after death. Pat Tucker can understand this. You ask, ask Pat sometime about that. Revelation 20.11 describes all the unbelieving being resurrected and judged at the great white throne and then cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is actually the term is hell. So often we say he dies and goes to hell. Technically, no. They go to Hades. I'll get into that. Take a look at Revelation. It says, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deed. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the 
and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Now, understand that, that even though unbelief, or let me back up. Here we have hell in the Old Testament is the lake of fire. Is it, hell is the lake of fire. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, immediately after death, after someone dies and they are not a believer, they will go to Sheol, which is in the Old Testament, that is Hebrew, or Hades, which is the New Testament, that is Greek. They both mean the same thing. And that is the place of, of, a, of a temporary holding place. Now understand that, that even though unbelievers are not instantly sent to the lake of fire where they will burn for all of eternity, this Hades is not a place you want to go. I mean, it is not a place, they, they will go to a place that, that, is, that is burning, They're a place that is on fire. In fact, take a look. The rich man, in Luke 16, he cries out, and I am in agony in this flame. So while he is not in the lake of fire, hell, where he does go while waiting the white throne judgment is a terrible, terrible, terrible place. People, being eternity-minded is so important. Understanding what living for eternity does, that what we do here on earth makes a difference about what happens for eternity for us. And it makes Revelation twenty-two fourteen all the more important. Check out. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Let me just say, notice the tree of life is there. Where else did you see the tree of life? In the Garden of Eden. And God, in his sovereign wisdom, told Adam and Eve, you've got to leave here because you may wind up eating from the tree of life and live forever in your sin. He kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. There's the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So in the... Genesis, we have a tree of life. In Revelation 22, we have a tree of life as well. We're living between the trees. <laughs> right? We are. That's what, that's what figuring this out, taking this journey is, living between the trees. And once you get blessed of those who do his commandments, they may have the right to the tree of life. You can eat of the tree of life in glory. I'm sure it's great. And he goes on to say, and many enter through the gates, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside, picture that. You've got gates into the city. Outside the gates are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So I am of the persuasion that hell is not millions of miles from heaven. That part of the hell is the fact that I can't get into there. I can see it. I just can't get there. For Lazarus and the rich young ruler, there's a chasm between them, a great divide that he couldn't get to. Okay, I, I went through a lot for this one. I'm going to give you one more example, then I'm going to be done. This next one... Uh, this next person doesn't question the existence of God. This, this person, in fact, um, acknowledges Jesus Christ as Savior, as Savior of their life. This person, in fact, loves the promises that are proclaimed in the Bible. And she agrees with all, I'm making her, I'm making this a woman this time. She agrees with all the teachings of the church. The thing is, her life runs opposed to what she says she believes. Yeah, she attends church. She goes to all the church functions. She does a lot of good things, if they interest her. She's fun to be with. In fact, a lot of unbelievers enjoy being around her. Of course, she's really careful not to rock the boat. We'll call her Florence. It's Florence's turn now. She's called to the Great Hall of Judgment. She's led toward the throne, and she's experiencing many of the similar things that Albert felt. Florence is given the same order as Albert to give an account for her stewardship, and just like Albert, her life comes laid bare before her eyes. 
She's thinking, ah, it's not too bad. Well, all of a sudden, some of the indiscretions are showing up. All of her deceptive life. When all of her sins, and I'm talking even about the ones that you and I justify, we know those sins pretty well. Well, you know, that's okay. When all of her sins were brought to light before the sinless, majestic, holy, sovereign judge, she was more than ashamed. But unlike Albert, Florence had publicly said that she believed in Jesus and she professed her allegiance to him. Then, like Albert, Jesus announces that her name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Florence is found guilty of denying Jesus by the way she lived. Paul says this about that, those people. He said, such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They're detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. I, I find it interesting how Paul and Jesus both, when somebody's claiming to be in the church, somebody claiming to be a follower, but doesn't live like a follower, they hammer them pretty hard. So if you ever feel like you get hammered here by being a follower, just doing like Jesus and Paul did, you know, because we should be, we know better. But they were very graceful to those who didn't know. And that's how we should be to those who don't know. Be very filled with grace. So, it'd be easy to question this judgment. It'd be easy to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Since Florence went to church every week, was involved in a lot of church activity, taught vacation Bible school, even called Jesus Lord, wasn't she good to go? But Jesus said this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet don't do what I tell you? And, and in Matthew 7, he says this. Not all who sound religious are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still won't get to heaven. For the decisive question is whether they obey my Father in heaven. At the judgment, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we told others about you and used your name to cast out demons and to do many other great miracles. But I will reply, you have never been mine. Go away, for your deeds are evil. These scriptures can be pretty indicting sometimes. Or we might argue she believed, she had faith. Well, what's James say about that? What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? And the psalmist said in, in Psalm 50, But God says to the wicked, Why bother reciting my decrees and pretending to obey my covenant? For you refuse my discipline and treat my words like trash. When you see thieves, you approve of them and spend your time with adulterers. Your mouth is filled with wickedness and your tongue is full of lies. You sit around and slander your brother, your own mother's son. While you did all this, I remained silent. You thought I didn't care. But now I will rebuke you, listing all of my charges against you. So Florence, who lived a life of deceiving herself, receives the same sentence that Albert does. Now, <clears throat> these two examples are just types of people. There's many, many, many others that I could go and pick on. These are people who are going to be disappointed in Judgment Day. And you might be saying, Tim, why do you need to know this? And I'll get into this in the next week or so. This is a basic teaching that people need to have. The Bible tells us that. 
It is a basic principle. It's basic to discipleship. It's basic to understanding our faith, our belief, what we're called to, what's ahead of us. And understand that, and these people, these suggestions, these, these illustrations I'm given, I'm not pointing to anybody here in this room. I got, I got enough other stuff to handle without pointing things out. All right? I'm not, I'm not doing that at all. But maybe, just maybe, you know somebody who has that independent spirit who says, I don't need God. Maybe, just maybe, you know someone who's living a life that's deceived. They're deceiving themselves and trying to deceive other people along the way. Or maybe you know someone who's living in a backslidden state. If you know people that are like this, now is the time that you're called to witness to these people, to bear witness to them. And you may say, Tim, you know, my Uncle Jed is like that. But, you know, I don't want to be unloving and unkind to him. So, you know, I'm just, I don't want to, he'll be upset, he'll be this. And, you know, and, and we make those excuses because we want to be liked. I want Jed, Uncle Jed, to like me, so I'm not going to tell him. But I'm going to tell you what. Not telling somebody is the most unloving thing you can do. If you want your friends, your family, people you know, in eternity, in heaven with you, then you will tell them the results of the ways if they keep on living the life that they live. I'm sorry. That's just how it is. If you love them, you'll tell them. So I want to encourage you. Let's you and me, from this day, take stock of our own situation and answer the question, are we living out the commands that are set before us in God's word? Are we being true disciples? If you want to know more about discipleship, talk to Sam or me later. Sam's got a thing along the way he's doing. Check him out. Sam has a call to make disciples. We need to make disciples, not just converts. Any one of these people I just told you about, and any other people that have already gone to Hades, that have already gone to that internal torment, would love to have a chance to do it all over again. Read the parable of the rich young ruler. He would love to have a chance to do it all over again, but they can't. It is forever. They will live in eternal torment, fiery heat, putrid stench because of living for self. I say we take as many with us if we're going out of this world as we can. Let's pray. Father God.